surprised if he's like that for the rest of the show. That is all. And now, with that being said, here is the podcast featuring Kyle the Pug, a.k.a. Kyle Lodi, and that idiot, Cowboy Nick. Here we go. And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the podcast episode number 63, only on the YouTube channel of Kyle the Pug Sports. Now, I just before we get started today, I just want to say thank you guys so much for 4,000 subscribers, even though my regular YouTube channel is kind of glitching out for no reason because it has a tendency of doing that. But either way, I did hit that magic number. Proud of you guys for subscribing to my channel. I'll make good content for you guys, and hopefully we can go for 5,000 once uh, everything is set and under control. So, that being said, I'm, of course, Kyle the Pug, a.k.a. Kyle Lodi. Welcome to the podcast episode number 63, and <clears throat> we have a good show on tap for you today. Of course, it's going to be a two-hour show, so why am I even bothering you saying this? So... Let's get on with this. So, here's the individual with brain problems, diabetes, and hearing voices in his head. It's Cowboy Nick. How you doing, folks? You know, I don't hear voices, and I don't have diabetes. You s- no, don't, don't even know. say it. You're going to get fired if you say it. See Kyle, see, Kyle, when he was like, like I said, folks, Kyle, when he was a little kid, he didn't get the toys he wanted, so... <laughs> He, uh, Actually, I did, but that's a completely different story. He has an emotion. He has emotional. <laughs> he has an emotional setback from his natural life, so that's that's what's going on. Are you confusing me with yourself? I, I don't. When have you a, ate all those pancakes I, when you were a kid with syrup, that's how you got overweight. What? That's what Are Larry you? told me. Ah. That's what Larry told me a long time ago. Well, you and my uncle must have some, you and my uncle must, be like, well, have some, like, plans to, like, murder me or something. No, we don't. We're just trying to, we're trying to help you become a better person. That's pretty and much what it is. I am a better person. Well, that's what you say that now, but then you do some stupid things like fall into a door, getting slapped by your, by your two uncles at the Super Bowl party. Oh, and the list goes on I and on. Slipped. And fell and hit the door. I didn't fall into the door. I slipped. Well, either way, you still fell into the door regardless. Yeah, and it hurt like hell. And not to the fact that you got slapped by your two uncles. Don't disrespect Tom Brady, and uh, don't be rude if when you're in front of the guests. So I still have that. I still, I, I still kind of have the ring mark on my face from when my uncle decked me. So yeah. And that was very disrespectful. So this is why Cowboy Nick should be a better person. Instead of just running his mouth all the time, like he always does. Isn't that right, Bill? Yes, Bill is nodding his head. Thank you very much. But with that being said, let's get on with today's topics. Now, we got, of course, six topics for each of the segments, the hot topics. We got a nice show for you guys. We're going to talk about the Westminster Kale Club Dog Show later on. Plus, we got the AT&T Pebble Beach results also later on. But first off, right now, we're going to talk about some of the... Um, rumors that are happening around the NBA, and that involves, of course, the NBA trade deadline. Now, it is in a couple of hours, so who's on, who's going to be on the move, where are they going to go, and how they're going to affect the entire team? So, basically, the main, <clears throat> the main attraction we're looking at here <clears throat> is Blake Griffin might be going to the Cavaliers, and then there are four more potential deals for NBA superstars as well, so... The Clippers are basically taking their time to look through the Griffin deals from all the NBA teams. So, one of the, yeah, because we're going to talk about the rest of the uh, people first. But, the five big trade targets, of course, Blake Griffin, I mentioned, Kevin Love, Dwight Howard, as we talked about, you know, a couple of, um, like, like a show ago, then Al Horford and Carmelo Anthony, and... 
These are the kind of offers it would take to get a deal done. So, let's talk about Blake Griffin first. So, do you see, I mean, yeah, Blake Griffin, the rumors are going to the Cavaliers, LeBron, with LeBron James this, LeBron James that, blah, blah, blah. So, do you see him go, being traded out of the, out of LA to go to Cleveland? Let's just uh, start Honestly, off, sorry, I then. don't know about that, but I've heard, I've all, I've actually, from some of the people I've talked to, I've heard, um, around, um, around that it's, po- that it might be possible for him to maybe go into it, um, uh, also looking into him is Atlanta, New York, and, um, uh, from what I've heard too is Miami, but I don't see him going to the Cavaliers for the simple fact that Cavaliers right now are basically, um, all LeBron James this and LeBron James that and... I swear, if I have to hear one more thing about LeBron James from like the Cavaliers, I swear I'm gonna like, I swear I'm, I'm gonna like, I'm gonna like run, in, I'm gonna, like run on into the middle of the street and just have a car just say hit me. Well, uh, that, well, that again, everybody would like like to see that, except for your uncle. Yes, I know that, but I'm just saying that because it's like, it's like seriously, I understand LeBron James is a good player, but how, I, like. You can love a person too much, and their head gets too fat. So you know what I mean. It's it's <laughs> it's too fat. No, but we're saying like you can't deny that. You cannot deny that. <laughs> you cannot deny that with, with the Cleveland Cavaliers that it, like the fans they love they love. The okay, Rockets so fans. going going back to uh, Blake Griffin here really quick. I mean, you say Atlanta, and then of course we're talking about the Cleveland Cavaliers possibly a potential uh, candidate for him. To, uh, for Blake Griffin to land in Cleveland. So uh, let's talk about some of the other teams he could go to. You, see, you were talking about Atlanta and New York, and maybe I guess you could put, put Orlando in there. I'm not sure exactly. But yeah. what about Miami, for instance? Or maybe, you know, <clears throat> maybe possibly the um, what was it? The Chicago Bulls, for example. Maybe they could yeah. use somebody with their Jokey, the Jokey Noah situation. He would be a good fit there. But these are just like I don't know for sure if that if it's going to happen. But these are just um, from what I've heard from some uh, from some inside sources. So I'm not sure on how that's going to work. But we will we have to we'll have to find out. But if he does go to Cleveland, I don't think he's going to be a good fit in there because I think it's going to he's not going to be able to do um, to use the skills that he has um, the way he should. All right, so let's move on here to our next guy. Which is, of course, Kevin Love. So, <clears throat> Kevin Love has been on the trade value for at least a couple of seasons now, and they're actually they're actually looking into the Cavaliers are trying to actually look into uh, trading Kevin Love to uh, a team he can actually help improve because, of course, LeBron James, you know, him in this situation, and uh, who's going to be the star player, blah blah blah. So. Where do you see Kevin Love going in all this? Yeah, it's like I said, it's looking it's looking really well. But the fact is, like for me, like how's it looking really well? I don't get it. Well, it, like I said, I with the trade right now, it's looking pretty. pretty it's looking pretty. Um, it's looking no, pretty nobody's good. been traded yet. I mean, well, I'm asking yeah, you the but question. The way, it's go, the way it looks, it looks <clears> like it could be some pretty good deals. But honestly, I just if don't they see ever happened. I just don't see him going to Cleveland. I just don't think Cleveland would be a good set. Uh, no, he is in. He is on Cleveland. I know, but I like I said, I just don't see like with you know who going to Cleveland. I just don't see a good. I don't see it to be a good set. There. Now these, like I said, these deals haven't happened yet. So, and we're basically, as I said before, the earlier of the show, two hours away from the trade deadline, so Correct. there's going to be a number of teams that they're going to be wanting Kevin Love, of course, and they're looking for a big guy, so yeah. that being said, <clears throat> I would say, I would say maybe, of course, Miami would be looking for a big guy to help out with Chris Bosch, yes. or yes. I, uh, New York would be another example, and the Lakers and their woes, they're probably going to be looking for another big guy, since, of course, uh, Roy Hibbert, you know, can't get the job done. And well, I mean he can, but I mean it hasn't really been looking yeah, too yeah, well I for him. I know what you mean by that. I know what you mean by that. It's just, the, it's just like with with the Lakers, they just need okay. To- so well, we'll hold that thought for a second. But I gotta rename all the other teams here real quick, and maybe pot. Well, 
everybody's talking about, you know, Blake Griffin for Kevin Love heads up at the Clippers, but I just don't think that's going to happen. I mean, the camp going to the Clippers could be a possibility, but I just don't see it really, you know. I mean, it's possible because, you know, Kevin Love is an L.A. guy, UCLA graduate, all that. But other teams I could see him, maybe, you know, Phoenix. Um, there's another – somebody I, – I, I heard Chicago was looking for another big guy to help. Well, either way, either way, I still see all these teams trying to be in the potential for Kevin Love as well. And I'm, and I'm pretty sure that um, one of the next three guys coming up, I'm pretty sure it's going to be the same as well. <clears throat> right. So, uh, moving on, of course, to uh, Dwight Howard, who we talked about, you know, a week ago, yep. saying that, of course, he's not, they're going to be, Nick said, oh, they're going to be idiots for trading Dwight Howard, but looks like he really, this really might happen, and the, we'll see if this deal actually gets done. So, where do you see him, and where do you see this guy going? Well, if he's going to go anywhere, Dwight Howard, I would say, um, uh, I would say this, if he's going to go somewhere, I'm going to see him somewhere either, um, like I said, it could be Toronto, New York, or it's either Atlanta, uh, Atlanta, Orlando, or Miami. Uh, yeah, yeah you, you are definitely on that Atlanta bandwagon, I've been noticing. Well, it's not that I'm on the bandwagon. <laughs> cough, cough, bullshit. The fact is that I just see that, I just think that, with the way Atlanta has been looking um, this um, this year and everything, with the way they've been improving and stuff, it's they are looking like to be a developed team. And I just think that if he goes to like Toronto, I think he would um, be a good fit in there. Well, so you're saying he's gonna stay on the he's gonna go to the East Coast? That is what you're saying. Yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. He, he would I just don't see him going back to Orlando. I mean. Yeah, it was his original team, but he's 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 not gonna be um he's not gonna. I mean, if he pulls a LeBron James, and that's fine, but I just don't see him going and, back and there. And it happened too, like what what happened with LeBron James? Everyone's like, "Oh, I'm sorry for burning your stuff." No, I don't think it'll be like that. <laughs> it won't be like that. That's for sure. So with Dwight Howard, of course, I mean. Of course, the uh, teams I actually mentioned that could use him, I guess you could say the, uh, I guess the Boston Celtics would be another candidate, but, it I could, mean. It could, but the only thing with Boston is, the only thing with Boston is the fact that um, a lot of people have been saying that Boston's, some of Boston's deals that they've been making, they're not offering the uh, the right amount of money in the contracts. And people are saying that there's a problem with... Well, it's uh, not just that, but it's more like of an advantage to just the Celtics itself and not the other team. <clears throat> yeah, but the thing is, if you're not offering the right... If you're not doing the right kind of deal in the contract, your players aren't going to perform the way you want them to play, to perform. So if they're not performing the way you want them to perform, then you're not going to get the team that you want uh, the player that you want to perform for your team, and that, and then you're going to have problems. So, well, just like the Mavericks deal with the Celtics with Rayshon Rondo, look oh, how look how that turned out for them. That was just oh, I, I the, win, the winners on that end was Boston for sure. Of course, <laughs> of course it was. But you know, when I look at it right now, I don't think I think Boston's going to need a lot of work to to make itself better, but. When I'm actually looking at a team right now, and I'm looking at a team that's actually improving, even though I'm a Spurs fan, I'm looking at a team that's actually improving. I'm seeing some good things starting to come from um, from the Knicks, though, and, um, and things like that, because the Knicks have been showing some, have, since the All-Star game, have been showing some improvement. Speaking of the Knicks, let's talk about Carmelo Anthony. Where do you yeah. think he could end up if he decides to get dealt? From yeah, the next. I know. That's going to be something interesting. Where do you see him ending up? Carmelo Anthony? I can see, I'm seeing him more going more West Coast. All right, so what What West Coast team? Uh, if I had to pick, I have three. I'm not sure on, on which one would be a better fit, but the three that I have to pick is, I'm going to say one would probably be the Lakers. Two, I would say... I would see him going to a team like uh, maybe the Jazz, 
And then three could possibly be um, a, co- uh, a mix either between um, uh, Oklahoma or Sacramento. Well, a mix of the – you would call it Sacramento City or – well, no, no, what I mean by that is he can, it's like a, like he has, it's like it can lean to either side. Alright, so I can see, <clears throat> excuse me, I have to clear my throat a lot because allergies. So I would say, I would say Phoenix maybe. I mean, I don't know about the Lakers because they've had so many problems on their ends and, uh, they can't have, they really, they're trying to rely on their young nucleus to, um, Get their team. Of the Lakers, well, well, hold on. I'm not, I'm not finished yet. <laughs> Just hold your horses there, cowboy. And they're trying to rely on their young nucleus to actually get the job done. So I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't make if they um, wouldn't make any uh, deals trying to get him. And of course, Sacramento would be another example. And I could see maybe the Portland Trailblazers. I could definitely try to see them getting involved. But who knows from here? I mean. I think the likely candidates will probably be on the West Coast and not the East Coast because um, he's not a – Carmel Anthony's not an East Coast guy, and no, he's more no. of a West Coast person, and he wants yeah. to um, he wants to play for a team on the West Coast. I mean, he could have a reunion back in Denver, though. You never know. But either if way – that happens, that's going to be cra- – that would be crazy. All right. But either way, we can definitely see it happening. But the one thing I'm going to say about this, and I don't know if you agree with me or disagree with me on this, but I'm seeing some, I'm seeing that I think that, uh, for the Lakers, I think that ever since that, um, since we all know about, um, Kobe Bryant and everything, um, I think that are we going to start to see a dropping in performance with that team or are we going to see that team try to like rush itself more into improvement? What do you think? More of an improvement, because that team is not, that franchise is not known for, you know, dropping. They're trying to get their, like I said, they're trying to get their young nucleus to improve with, of course, D'Angelo Russell, and of course, they're leading that whole young nucleus squad with them, and uh, Julius Randle. You got a bunch of young players with top potential, so... It yeah, wouldn't be surprised. What's that? What's that? Then, no, uh, I just heard, uh, I don't know if, uh, you probably are, might not have heard about this, but I heard that there's supposedly a new assistant coach coming in. Uh, they got a new assistant coach, um, on the- Alright, well, let's hold that thought until, you know, at the, uh, well, coming up to the break here. So we got to talk about one more player really quick on the trading deadline market, and that's Al Horford. Oh, uh, this one I don't know. Like, honestly, I can't pick. A place for him to go because I just I he's like, I'm not saying he's a bad player or like, no he's really good though Al yeah, Horford's really really yeah, good he, he, like he's actually a really big name like uh, like what was that game he had a couple of weeks ago and he like what was it what was that scoring stat he had I know what you're talking about but it's hard yeah, for me to I um to think about it well right okay well okay, aside from that where do you see him going. Uh, honestly, if I have to pick this one, I'm gonna say, uh, I'm gonna, damn, it just, it's leaving a bad taste in my mouth, but damn it, I have to say he's probably gonna be looked at by, um, Washington, um. Ooh, Washington's a popular candidate, John yeah. Ball, hey The second one, the second one, I'm gonna say he's gonna be looked at by the, um, by the Pacers, and then the third one, I'm gonna say he's gonna be looked at by. And this really, this really hurts. I can me. give you three teams. This really hurts me. New York, me. Orlando, Indiana. But this is the this is the one that hurts me the most. Is I have to say he's I have to say he's probably gonna get looked at by by one West Coast team, and I'm gonna say the I'm gonna say um um the Clippers. Why? Well, well, <laughs> Well, either way, um, I could definitely see him going to, like like I said, New York, Orlando, Indiana. That's pretty much all yeah, I'm going to say. Yeah, but the, the one thing with Indiana, though, is that coach, that, um, I've actually heard that their, I can't remember his name now, but that their, their, um, their head coach is supposed to be a real dick. Well, uh, you, it's, it's all just a bunch of rumors and hearsay, Cowboy. Don't, yeah, read, don't believe that, anything you read sometimes. I've heard that he's supposed to be, like, his disciplinary on his, for his team is, like, amazing. So. Okay, so, uh, that all being said, and furthermore, we're going to be taking our first break of the show, and then coming up later on, we're going to be discussing the uh, 
NFL free agent wire on uh, which discuss on which player is going to be going to what teams and why, since there's now multiple players now instead of just one. Then we're going to talk about the uh, MLB offseason uh, best and worst of the offseason. And then we got the Pebble Beach results, why Phil Mickelson choked. And then we have, of course, the Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show. So, with that being said, we'll be right back here on the podcast, episode number 63. Again, thank you guys so much for 4,000 subscribers on my main YouTube channel, and we're going to keep going to build on to success. That being said, we'll be right back. Watching MTV, dreaming about a cipher up on BET. Tell my mom that's me sitting VI. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the podcast episode number 63 on Kyle the Pug Sports. I am Kyle the Pug, aka Kyle Lodi, and this individual has still his having haunting dreams of a certain things being chased around with blonde pigtails. It's Cowboy Nick. I don't know, folks, and no, I don't have, and they're not, and. And I don't know why he's thinking I, I, I get any chased by things with blonde pigtails. That's kind of, I haven't had a dream like that in four years, so. Well, that's because you had too much LSD. I don't even take LSD. I tell you, I, the medication, I, I, I can't, I, I can say that, I will say this, and you fancy comment on this audio, like, I take, I take epileptic medication, and that stuff is better than LSD. I'm just putting it, let's just put it that way. <laughs> yeah, it puts you on the good kind, where it makes you see, like, a bunch of unicorns and ponies. I've and had all... that once. <laughs> with that shit. With, with, like, with that stuff, yes. It does do that. I'll take the pill, and then, like, I'll, like, I'll just, like, relax for a little bit, and then, like, four hours later, I'm laying down, and then... And you're, like, like in a grassy so field, and you're surrounded by and unicorns. It's rain, and sometimes it rains in Africa. Yeah, and you're surrounded by unicorns and ponies and all that, and it's just a grand old time for you. But anyways, going back to our topics here really quick. So we're going to be talking about the NFL free agent wire and what's going down. Since it has updated, we're going to give you some inside scoop on some certain players and where they might possibly heading. So remember, remember a week ago when we talked about Matt Forte possibly going to Green Bay, or actually you said that, not me. Yeah. I, I well, well it could it could actually happen though. So as people have been saying on ESPN, and of course you know the supporters have, as well have been saying it would make sense if Matt Forte went to Green Bay. It because it, it just like for me Matt Forte would be a perfect fit. Would just it just seemed like he'd be a good fit there. It'd be a low blow, as I said in last week, but I guess yes. it could make sense because they do need, of course, a uh, Aaron Rodgers and then the Matt Forte combo. He'd probably get involved in the passing game too. Yeah, he would, and that would be that would be like oh man, that would be like wow. You know, it would be like it would be just wow if he did that. I was just saying that, like, when I, when I first said that, don't get me wrong, I first said that, I thought of it as just a, a like, a, a place which would be a good fit. I didn't think that they, that people would actually agree with me and, and all that. I just felt, I when I heard that, I was Shocking. Like, oh. Hell just froze over because everybody agreed with Cowboy Nick. <laughs> That's what it feels like. Don't get me, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. That's what I kind of felt like at first because I was like, oh, crap, um... Oh, He's crap, like, how? I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. People are agreeing with me. <laughs> and people rarely agree with Cowboy Nick. That's like the, that's like the one of those things that you, those moments that just rarely. Yeah, happen. people rarely agree with you because you're an idiot at times. And now I know how Joe from Stockton feels. Shout out to him, by the way. Yeah, what's up, Joe? I said shout out to him. He's not He's not on the show. I just said what's up, Joe. Yeah, 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 and then he had that awkward pause acting like he was on the show. So, once again, I Cowboy mean, Nicks, respect. fail! Respect. R-E-S-P-C-T. Respect. <laughs> okay, so going back into a forte really quick. So, if he actually ends up going to the Packers, I know he doesn't do it not now, but let's say he ends up going there. 
Would he be considered a traitor to, to the Bears fans? Yes or no? Uh, I'm not going to say yes or no, but I'm going to say most likely yes because it's going to be like most like. But you did not. Yeah, you just said yes. So. Because the way I'm looking at it is, I'm looking at. I'm it not going to say yes or no, but most likely yes. No, no, no. no I, I, <laughs> oh think god, that's funny. No, think back. Think back to. Let's go back to the NBA a little bit. Think back to. Um. Well, think back to when LeBron. Um. Came, when LeBron came back to the Caval. Um. First left the Cavaliers. Well, obviously, yeah. Well, that's okay, well, that's... Thing. That's the kind of moment I could see that would happen with Matt Forte. Well, I mean, he's 30 years old. He's, like, basically in the uh, prime of his career, going near the uh, down end of his career. He's not there yet, but he's, like, near the down end of his career. But we'll, well see what Matt happens Forte, from there. I'm going to say this, too. He's, he's still a uh, Titan, nevertheless, especially oh, in fantasy football. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. will he be... Um, Will he be uh, one of these uh, a potential ho- um, Hall of Famer? <laughs> yes. Obviously. You know, because like God, I, I, I'm already see, I've already said to a couple of my friends, and I haven't said this to you, but I've said this to a couple of my other friends. I actually was talking to a um, I was working in my yard with some of my um, guys from my from the the Mormon church and stuff like that. We were working in the backyard and in the front yard, just cleaning up everything. And we were talking about Matt, Matt Forte and one of my, one of the elders, he's from um, Chicago. He actually said, God, I hope that Matt Forte does not leave my team because I'm on my that's, mission. And that's, he's my it's hero. too late. It's too late. He's already done it. Yeah. I told that's, him that. I was always, that's what I could have, would have said. Oh, it's too late. Sorry, it's already happened. I told him Bye. I go, he's already leaving, and he was uh, and, and as they were, um, like he lost all faith in society because his favorite person is leaving on his favorite team. Well, we had to carry him. Well, he basically what happened is he passed out, and we had to carry him to the car. Uh huh. Yeah. See, that's how I guess that's how people react to a uh, little when they get a little too emotional over the slightest things. Yes, exactly, exactly. And cowboy Nick also too. Hey, 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 I don't get that. I don't pass out. No, I'm just saying, you get a little too emotional. I never said you didn't pass out. I'm yeah, just saying I, you I get a little get too... I a little too emotional, but sometimes I can't help it. Like, I just, like, there's, some, there's like, sometimes you can't help that because there's, like, you grow up watching them, you see, you've seen them play, you, you just, you just, you know, the respect is just so right there. Hashtag respect. Oh, come on, Kyle, Kyle, don't you agree with it? Like, I just said, he- never mind. No, no, okay, so, okay, moving on, of course, moving on. Aren't you sad that he's leaving? Well, he's not retiring, but, well, he's not on my team, so, you know, why, why should I, why should I, I mean, I mean, I do care in a little ways, but. you're a Lakers fan. Well, okay, okay well, we're talking about. Oh, you're talking about something completely different. I'm, we're talking about, I'm in the NFL still. I'm completely in the NFL with Forte. Okay, let's, let's just, let's just, let's just move on and just stay on topic here really quick because Bill is getting tired of you and I'm just <laughs> going off topic over and over and over again. Drink a beer, again. Bill. Drink a beer. So anyway, no, he's not even mad. He's just, it's, he says it's, you're predictable, but. Anyways, going back to the uh, NFL here really quick. Um, Mike Wallace is another potential free agent to go somewhere, and the top priority team that everybody's been talking about is the Detroit Lions yeah, with the possibility of losing Cal- have, Calvin Johnson. A lot about that. Yeah, with the possibility of lo- from you know losing Calvin Johnson. I hope not. Like <laughs> if that, if that happens, Calvin Johnson, that's going to be such a that's going to be such a heartbreaker for them. No, but I'm saying like he's there been there's been news going around him that he's gonna retire. Yeah, but like I said, that's like I said, it will be such a heartbreaking moment because like if they lose, yeah, him, yeah, I'm pretty sure it'll at this, happen. Look, look, look at what he's done for that team. Uh huh. Barring having a Super Bowl ring, of course. No kidding, but still, it's just like like, but it's just gonna be one of those like for me, it's just gonna be like if, if even I, even though I'm not. Even though I'm with Dallas, but I'm not. I'm um, I I still have respect for the Lions and stuff. I will cry because I grew up watching him. He's a good guy. He's a he's a great player and great skills. And it's just one of those moments where he can, where he can just have one of those moments where he can ju- and just do what he has to do. All know? right. So, Mike Wallace to the Lions. Yes or no? 
do you see it happening? I uh, I could see it happening, but I I I don't quote me on this. I could see it happening, but for all my fans and everything out there, don't quote me on him going there because I know there's other teams that are like that will that will um, potentially want want him. All right, so uh, moving on uh, from, of course, the uh, aerosol game. How about uh, how about Robert Griffin the third? Even though he hasn't really been getting uh, much success out of the NFL, do, uh, barring of course his rookie season, and then after that, it's been injury after injury after injury, and yeah. looks like the uh, yeah the Redskins are might be thinking about releasing him due to the fact that Kirk Cousins might be the uh, full time starter over there. So. A team that definitely needs a QB, of course, would be in this situation since now RG3 is possibly going to be a free agent at this point. So, that being said, there is like a few teams in the running to get him, and one of the te- one of the teams that's not in it, from what I've read, that's right, you heard me correctly, not in the running is the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah, I've heard that too, but you you look at Dallas, they they don't really need a QB that much. Well, Tony Romo is on the verge of the down yes. end of his career. Yes, so they're going to look for a guy in the draft that could back up Tony Romo once he retires. Exactly. But 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 the main thing I, I when I look at Dallas and I look at that team, the main thing I'm looking at with that team that they that they really are looking into getting is I would say maybe a back uh maybe some um uh, couple of running backs and some um and some more receiving and um a little bit more strength in the receiving core. Okay, so okay, so just to help I mean the receiving core is actually really, really good. I mean they probably need more help defensively is what they need help on. But going back to of course R G three here really quick I mean, I could definitely see, you know, three possible teams I could definitely need, you know, a quarterback. And one of them Shockingly, one of them, from what I've read, one of the teams that I read that could use a QB, of course, with that uh, quarterback depth chart that they have, is of course the now the LA Rams are in the yeah, discussion. Yeah, I, 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 I knew I knew that was coming because LA is was I was knowing that for a long time that LA was going to find themselves that. Well, that, it's possible. I didn't say it was going to happen. I'm just saying it's one of the three teams. And then the other two would be, you know, San Francisco. Francisco. Well, I don't know about San Francisco being on the list, but I know. Uh, it, <laughs> you look at what they, you look at the team from last year, and you'll you'll kind of agree. Yeah, they do need a, a QB. And let's see what else. What else? Um, um, the Texans do need one, and yeah, I would say Seattle might be a possible. Seattle was. Um, no, nah, not Seattle though. They have Russell Wilson. They'll be fine with him. And of course, that I think the um, let's see, the same. Well, I wouldn't say San Diego, but Kansas. No, not Kansas City. But um, I think either the West Coast team or an AFC team is likely where I see Robert well, Griffin third going. Well, if I'm gonna look at, if I'm gonna look at this, maybe maybe the Cleveland Browns, where all careers die. Yeah, which, yeah. No. I'm, yeah, I'm joking. No, he's no, 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 no. He's not going to Cleveland. No, I can't really see him um, going to Cleveland. Could, what about Baltimore? No, they got Flacco. That's kind of a endless. Yeah, but he's getting he's getting to that point where he's where he's starting to get to the point where he's gonna be thinking about maybe um, hanging up his cleats. Um, how about how about the Philadelphia Eagles? Cough, yes, cough. I was thinking that too. I was like, Philly does need him. Does. Yeah, Definitely. Sam Bradford's not cutting it in for, of course, yeah. the Philadelphia Eagles and ball. And Nick Foles kind of was the same, but he only did a little better. But he didn't really get a, like a touchdown since week one. So, yeah. anyways, um, yeah. So those are the teams I could likely see RG three end up end up going. It's probably the Rams, the Niners, the Eagles, and I guess I guess he could maybe throw the Texans in there too. Yeah, and maybe possible. yeah, and maybe a possibly you could throw another AFC team in there also. But it's more than likely, um it's more than likely he could end up like on the West Coast or something. But speaking yeah. of the Browns, we were talking about that really quick. They were trying to think about releasing Johnny Manziel, and that actually does make sense. Yeah, that does make that does make sense, but the, the... Where all careers go to die in Cleveland. No, I'm just joking. I'm not, I'm not saying Cleveland is bad, but I mean, 
some of their sports teams, you know, Cavaliers, I guess you could say the Indians are somewhat yeah. decent, but not the Cleveland Browns, though. But I'm gonna, but the one thing I'm going to say this is if they release him, who is going to pick him up? Jacksonville. No, I'm just joking. Not Jacksonville. No um, there's going to be there's going to be teams out there that are going to be um, they're going to probably in the need for the hunt for a quarterback. Like, of course, maybe San Francisco. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I had a laugh when I was saying that, too, because it'd be so hilarious if San Francisco. I mean, it would make sense that, of course, they have the situation with Kaepernick and Blaine Gabbard and and all those other, you know, situations at the QB spot, but, yeah, they probably need, like, another guy to back them up, just in case, you know, one of them goes down, is what I'm saying. Yeah, but the thing is, but like I said, but I'm going to say this, it, it, there's, for me, if, if Cleveland releases him and everything, I'm going to say this, there is one team, I, I have been, I don't know if it's going to happen, but there's one team I have thought of that might might be a good fit for him, and I'm going to say it could be, um, it, you could get um, the Redskins involved. Well, it's possible to get the uh, Redskins involved, but it's going to be, um, it's going to be interesting to see uh, what they're going to do. With, well, I mean, Kirk Cousins is going to be the legitimate starter. I mean, having a backup wouldn't hurt, but yes. think of all the drama that could carry out to that team, because Johnny Manziel's kind of a hothead since coming into the NFL, thinking, what you know... Johnny never been a hothead for Kirk I'm Cousins. talking about when he actually got into the draft and didn't finish school and he thought he was like yeah. the king of the world and everything but in reality's terms he's not like that on the field so he actually, he actually sucks well go okay so go back to uh Calvin Johnson here real quick so um they're still awaiting on a uh, Megatron's decision as we discussed you know a while back so let's discuss on his motives here really really quick so we got like a few minutes left here Let's let's talk about it. So retire or keep playing for the Lions? What do you think? Honestly, I say for him, I would say one more year. Give give Detroit one more year. So you're saying one more year and being one of the best receivers in the NFL next to DeAndre Hopkins yes. and Antonio Brown, and he got all all those other wide receivers out there too. Jordy Nelson didn't even play a season, so. <laughs> you didn't even see his name all year because he was yeah. out before but the season I, I started. Think that Detroit, I, I think if he gives one more year with Detroit, it's gonna make um, he'll be able to retire because everyone will be satisfied, uh, and he'll be able to go out with that with that with that final goodbye. You know. Yeah. Speaking of final goodbyes, Charles Woodson is finally. Um, well, he's retired now, and he now he joins ESPN as an NFL analyst, so it makes Which sense. Which is good fit for him, yes. So. That's basically where everybody's going, so, yeah, Ray, <laughs> well, yeah. I guess Ray, well, yeah, Ray Wilson's on there, or Ray, Ray Wilson, Ray Lewis is on there, so, and then you now you got Charles Woodson on there, too. You got Shaq on there, too, you have Shaq. Shaq's on TNT. He's a, he's a basketball analyst, and he's on TNT, so, yeah. Don't forget, you'll get to see him tonight on at 5 and 7.30, so. Oh, yeah, you're going you're gonna to go that route. What? I'm not, I'm, what? I didn't say anything was wrong. I'm just saying you usually like to go on routes that are predictable. <laughs> he's like, yeah, 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 whatever. But it's true. I'm not mad at you. I'm just saying, you know, know it's true. Know, I'm just saying the fact is that. It's gonna be. It's gonna be pretty good. It's gonna be. Um, it's gonna be pretty good. You know, seeing to see um, to see the Bulls going up against um, the Cavaliers, and then you got the you got. Well, that's a completely different topic to talk about there. So, what are your thoughts so far on the NFL free agency as of right now? So far, I'm just gonna say this: Detroit, give him one more year. Um, Matt Forte, if you do become a, um, if you do become, go and play for Green Bay, I'm going to say this to you. If you ever go back into, um, Chicago, wear a bulletproof vest and a sweater. Well, all I have to say to that is, okie dokie, 
But anyways, we're going to take our, another commercial break here, our little 30-second break, wink, wink. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about the best and worst moves of the Major League Baseball offseason, which now all these things to talk about. So we'll be right back after a word from these sponsors. We'll be right back, people. <laughs> And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the podcast episode number 63 of the Kyle the Pug Sports YouTube channel. I'm Kyle the Pug, a.k.a. Kyle Lodi, and this is, of course, an individual who thinks highly of himself, but just like Johnny Manziel has a few problems of his own, it's Cowboy Nick. How y'all doing, folks? And yes, uh, one of my problems is that the, the Cubs are still around and they, they won't die. Well, you can try to solve that problem with the Cubs themselves after the Cardinals got knocked out by them in the playoffs. So, that being said, speaking of baseball, we are going to get to the best and worst MLB offseason moves as of right now. So, we're going to resu- we're going to have a little poll here that was actually discussed and of course that uh we're going to talk about uh, who made the best moves and who made the worst moves, you know, from uh, this offseason. So, that being said, we're actually going to um, take a look at the most uh, improved teams in the National League. And we have a, um, there's a little pull here between three teams with the Diamondbacks, the Cubs, of course, Cowboy Nick's going to be too thrilled when I said that, and of course, the San Francisco Giants. So, that being said, let's talk about who was the most improved team out of these three teams in the National League. So, the votes were in, and it says that the Diamondbacks got the majority of the votes between the three teams. Well, I will agree with that. The Diamondbacks have been improving. They have been, their, their team has been growing, and... Well, of course, getting Zach Granke kind of yeah. helped out their pitching squad just a bit. Yeah. Which was a good thing. Um, Chicago, they got lucky, so that's... Well, you're, of course you're angry at Chicago, and you have a vendetta, we get it, it makes sense. You got, you got to stay unbiased. I'm not being biased, I'm just saying they got lucky. Yeah, that's being biased. On my book. But, uh... <laughs> you're so, yeah, maybe not in your book, but... In everyone else's book, you gotta stay unbiased. That's how this works. Yeah, well, they suck anyway. But, um, and yes, we cowboy Nick is mad. He hasn't had his medication, and he needs to go meditate with Bill. So, anyways, go on to the San Francisco Giants real quick with their votes. They got they were in third place in the votes with six votes, and the Cubs had thirteen in second place. And of course, like I mentioned, the Diamondbacks with twenty-two. So. This basically, we're talking about the most shocking winter, and we're almost guaranteed that the Diamondbacks would have won that too. So, within the 29 other offices in the Major League, a, lo- a lot of really smart people were scratching their heads and describing this team's ultra-aggressive offseason with, with words such as, of course, hard to fathom, and that's because really nobody saw this coming. So, raise your hand if you predicted in October that the D-backs would be the club blurring $206.5 million as Zach Greinke. Raise your hand if you saw them dropping the number one pick in the country in June. Shortstop Dansby Swanson into a package that brought Shelby Miller over here as well. So, basically, if you didn't raise your hands, well, that's that, there's your first problem. Why do we get the feeling that this part of this uh, go-for-it eruption that Chief Baseball Officer Tony La Russa and GM Dave Stewart enjoyed most? They knew they were risking a little, lo- little to long-term peril. <clears throat> for a dramatic short-term assault on the reign of the Dodgers and the Giants in the NL West. And you know what? In, th- in just three words, they didn't care. What are your thoughts on those three words? I just have to say, ha, ha, ha. Because, like, you look at Diamondbacks right now, they really are starting to rebuild. They're really... Their team's 
looking like it's it could be a pretty good team this year. I'm not going to say it's going to be the best, but it's gonna, it's looking like it's going to be improving. one of those teams that you have to have respect for. Yeah, improving, in other words. Yes. All right, so now we can go to the most improved teams in the American League. And by the votes of this, this really does not shock you whatsoever. So, of course, the three teams were the Red Sox, the Tigers, and the Mariners. And what a surprise, the Red Sox, the Red Sox, the Red Sox got the most improved team by 27. Second place was the Tigers by 12. And the Mariners with four votes. So... Not shocking here, huh? Not really. Be, um, when I look at this, the team, um, I've really seen some um, work being done with um, Boston, and it's... Yeah, you see Boston making all these moves, though, but they were one of the yeah. worst teams in the uh, off season. So well, Yeah, but, they were, but... but not, the, not the worst teams in the off season, but the worst team last year in Major League Baseball due, of course, their problems. But... That being said, with apologies to Granky, we could argue basically that there wasn't a better starting pitcher who changed teams this winter than David Price. With apologies to Ordolis Chapman, we could also argue that there wasn't a better relief pitcher who we could call a moving ban this winter than Craig Kimbrell. Guess which team reeled both of them in? Yep, those both of those players went to the Boston Red Sox. Yeah, and, so, basically, how rare is it for a team to pull out two moves such as that in the offseason? Well... The answer, according to Elias Sports Bureau, is basically never. Elias says that the Red Sox are the first team in history to acquire a Cy Young starter and a closer who led his head blood leagues in saves at least four times in the um, <clears throat> same baseball winner. So, basically, there you go. So, now, obviously, it isn't up to Price to turn Hanley Ramirez into a real live Major League first baseman. And it isn't Craig Kimball's job to get Pablo Sandoval to hit the gym instead of the dessert buffet. But those two can't solve all the team's pressing issues. So, but what Dave Dombrowski set out in November to alter the face of his fan club, it was basically a few weeks before the whole planet knew exactly what and whom he had in mind. But his team still has big questions, but as one AL executive put it, it's hard to beat adding an ace and an elite closer to the exact team. So, that being said, of course, what are your thoughts on that whole situation with the Red Sox? I think that, I think that yeah, the Red Sox are going to start looking like the team that they should be, um, that a lot of people know them for. But if they get their act together, though, which of yes. course... Uh, Yes. Of course, that's basically, you know, Hanley's first base job, you know, Pablo hitting the gym and, you know, instead of the dessert buffet, and we all know how that went with that. And with all yeah. the, but, but, also, any, but also, too, I'm going to say this. Um, I'm not going to be surprised if we're not going to see a pretty good performance out of – we're going to see a, uh, a pretty good performance from Detroit or from – but speaking of the most unimproved teams, we're actually going to get to that right now. So we're going to look at, of course, the uh, the most unimproved teams. And they're actually, I would say, three, six. Oh, let me recount that. Three, six. I would see nine unimproved teams that we're going to um, talk about here. Of course, the... Um, and what I mean by that, we're going to be talking about the Pirates, the Phillies, the Dodgers, the Cardinals, the Braves, the Brewers, Padres, Reds, and the Rockies. And guess which team got first place out of the most unimproved teams, or most not first place, but most the most unimproved votes, Cowboy. Guess which team out of those nine teams? Fine. No, the Colorado Rockies. Yep. <clears throat> with 15 votes. So we had, of course, second place with the Reds with nine, Padres in third with eight, Brewers are bringing up the rear with six, Braves with five, the Cardinals also with five, Dodgers three, Phillies two, and, of course, the Pirates two. So let's, actually, let's talk about the Cardinals here really quick. So speaking of which, so they lost Jason Hayward and John Lackey to free agency. And if you want to add more insult to injury to Cowboy, the Chicago Cubs as well. So... They got a scary health bulletin on Yadier Molina, and they got outbid for their top free agent targets, which was the biggest shock. So, one executive also said, and I quote, for a team that's so used to getting whoever they want. And the Dodgers, it seems that every move 
seems like if every move they made was plan B, C, or Z on their uh, off-season priority list. So they've lost out on Granky. They had to back out for a deal with Chapman, and they didn't like the medicals on Hisashi Iwakuma. And it seemed like intent on hiring one of the um, one manager, Gabe Kapler, before winding up with a different one in Dave Roberts. So et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All that aside. This is still a deep, dangerous team with massive resources, but this this was one winner. Another executive said what it felt like is if, quote, nothing went the way it was supposed to, unquote. So your thoughts on both of those teams, the Cardinals and the Dodgers? Well, when I look at the Cardinals, I think that the Cardinals still have a chance to um, to show their to show their uh, – their talent and yeah, Jason do, Hayward, John Lackey no longer with them. As I as yeah. I quoted before, insult yep. to injury. Yeah, but the but when you look at the Cardinals, you know you know, um, St. Louis always has uh, has a has a beautiful um, um, has two beautiful minor league clubs. So there's always um, um, the potential for players to come up from those minor league organizations and become a part of. St. Louis and make the team um, and help the team out. But when you look at um, some of the other teams that we are talking about, with them, they have a bad. With them, it's not necessarily the players; it's the management. Mm-hmm. And, and basically, and, yeah. And especially with Colorado, last year I wanted to smack some of their uh, some of their office their office people because office people. You look at it. <laughs> no, there's the way you put it, though. It's funny. You look at but you look at their team. You look at them. The Rockies did so wrong last year, and really... They had the offense, there was just no pitching. No kidding, but the... the but they had... But the, a lot of their their management and stuff wasn't doing what it should have done, and, it, and there was a lot of people who have even said it, that the Rockies have the potential for stubbornness. Well, if they don't get enough pitching here quick. And it's not really their fault either because they play in a stadium where the ball elevates a lot. So, anyways, going to the most unapproved teams in the AL, we have, of course, three, seven teams between the two, between all these unapproved AL teams. And, of course, the Angels lead the way with 12 votes, the Orioles with 9, and, of course, the Athletics rounding out the top three with 8. So, in the rest of the way goes the race with 5, Indians 4, Blue Jays three votes and the Twins with, of course, three votes as well. So the Angels are arguing that they're wasting the prime years of Mike Trout's career, and the voters are clearly, you know, how they what they in the poll, they you know they clearly agreed with that. So owner Artie Moreno went out and hired a bright, a great, creative new GM and former manager, former Yankees assistant Billy Epler. Then promptly got fixated on not paying a nickel luxury tax that the Angels could not get their hands on that impact outfield bat that they needed. That is, of course, your definition of an impact outfield bat is a uh, Craig Gentry or, of course, Daniel Nava, who slugged, of course, 2.45 last year. So going on to the um, best free agent signings, of course, between these um, ball clubs, we have, of course... Not a surprise here, the Diamondbacks and the Red Sox rounding out the top two with the best free agent signings. And guess who's in third place behind those two teams, shockingly? You want to take a guess, Cowboy? Mine? No, actually, the Dodgers with Howie Kendrick, which is actually with... No, this this is actually... No, this is actually... This is actually true, though. They have ten votes on the fact that they brought back Howie Kendrick for a couple years, which they actually did... It was smart on their part to bring him back. Yeah, but the but the Dodgers are also doing a lot of things too to make their to start uh, to start fresh with their farm system. So that's why they have Plan B, C, and Z also at the same as the statement goes. So John Lackey with the Cubs, that's also right behind them. Ben Zobrist with the Cubs also, and then Jonas Cespedes, Alex Gordon tied with six, and then Justin Upton was with the Tigers was uh, number five. So, once we go to the, um, go to the, uh, worst free agent signings, of course, we have Ian Kennedy of the Royals going there, Jason Hayward with the Cubs that uh, filling into that second. Actually, though, there's a tie between that and Ryan Matson of the Oakland Athletics. 
And then we have Johnny Cueto. Actually, no, there's a three-way tie. Johnny Cueto, the Giants, now has the three-way tie for second place. And then Chris Davis with the Orioles. Jeff Samarja also with the Giants. And then Mike Pelfrey with the Tigers also with four votes as well. So let's. I want to recap a couple of things here uh, really, really quick. So out of all the categories in this poll... None can top this one when it comes out to a free-for-all votes. We had 26 players get at least one vote, and a dozen multiple votes were in there as well. There were special votes for, quote, anyone who got an opt-out and any pitcher who got over five years. Craziest of all, want to guess how many players got vote for best for both best and worst signing? How about 13 of those players, Cowboy? Makes sense, right? So maybe, so maybe the most notable guys on this leaderboard who landed on nobody's best list, you know, Ian Kennedy, Jeff Samarja, and Pelvery. Obviously, oddly, the two players who got at least three votes were the best and worst signings for both the Tigers, Upton and Jordan Zimmerman. So, your thoughts on those that list for the worst uh, free agent signings between all these? I teams. like, I, the, I agree with the list. But the other thing I'm going to say is, too, I've actually been watching some things about Baltimore, the Baltimore Orioles, and they are starting to become a team that they're, with their spring and um, their spring training and all that stuff, they are starting to come out and start to look like a team that um, could be considered a potential, um, potential hazard in the regular season. All right, so speaking of outrageous things, let's talk about the most outrageous contracts. And you were talking about the Orioles earlier, and so they nailed the top spot with Chris Davis with 16 votes. And then it's tied for second place between Jason Hayward and Zach Greinke. Both had 13 votes. David Price, 10 votes with the Red Sox, Ian Kennedy with the Royals, and, of course, Johnny Cueto with the Giants. So that being said, what do you think, what do you think personally – that with uh, the whole thing with Chris Davis and the Baltimore Orioles. I mean, that's just pretty outrageous, don't you think? Yes, I do think that is like, wow. But I, but when I, when I look at this, I, I say, I'm thinking to myself, could this mean that the uh, Baltimore could be a uh, potential, uh, could potentially be, um, could potentially be in one of those teams you, you have to put, uh, keep your eye on. That, um, this it's possible. Season? But there are a lot of other teams out there that are just jockeying for that same position. So it's pretty oh, yeah. much a free for all. Oh, yeah. and, and I and I have and I will and there's one thing I will tell people as well. Don't ever underestimate St. Louis. St. Louis could be down in the dirt for a little bit, but they but St. I Louis, never said they weren't. I'm just no, saying, I'm saying but they could, they but do I'm find ways out there. You look when you look at the St. Louis, they always find a way to bring themselves back up. And well, Hunter, Hunter wins season to only get knocked down in the first round by one of Cowboy Nick's Vendetta teams, the yes, Chicago and, Cubs. And when we look at the uh, when we look at this uh, Los Angeles Dodgers too, they're that same kind of team. They may get knocked down, but they always fi- try to find. They always seem to find a way to bring themselves back Especially up. Especially when you have one of the best pitchers on the planet on that team. Yes. So, that being said, we're going to talk about some of the trades here really quick. So, we got Dansby Swanson going to the Braves. That got the most votes there. Ardolis Chapman to the Yankees. And then Todd Frazier to the White Sox with eight votes. And I did not mention Chapman. He got 12 votes. And Corey Dickerson to the Rays with four votes. So, bargain free agent department. So, best free agent signed to a one-year contract. So, this is for, of course, people... <clears throat> that, of course, the best free agents to one-year deals. So, Doug Fester for the Astros, 11 votes. Hisashi Iwikama, who we talked about earlier, with 8 votes. Bartolo Colon with 7 votes for the Mets. Rich Hill of the Oakland Athletics, he got 7 votes as well. Alexi Ramirez with the Padres. Steve Pierce, the Rays, with 4. And, of course, Jonas Cespedes with the New York Mets. So... And, of course, yeah, there's a bunch of other things, too, So, but we're not going to have time to uh, cover all of them because we're going to be taking a break here, which is, I believe, right now. So, that being said, that has been, of course, the best and worst MLB offseason stats for you guys. 
So when we come back from this break going into our number two, uh, we're going to talk about the Pebble Beast recap and how Phil Mickelson choked. So with that being said, we'll be right back here on the podcast episode number 63, hour number two coming up. Stay tuned. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the podcast episode number 63. We are in our number two of this audio podcast show. I'm Kyle the Pug Sports. I'm Kyle the Pug, a.k.a. Kyle Lodi, and this individual who is going to be a cat person growing up, and still kind of is to this day, it's Cowboy Nick. I all doing? Yeah, he's, he's, four, he's 14 years old, and he's 25 pounds. He's a 25-pound cat. Leave him alone. Didn't never say anything bad about him, but we were just talking about you in general. Well, I like both dogs and cats. I'm not, like, just a particular, so. Well, anyways, let's get on to begin with our number two, shall we? So we're going to be talking about what happened with the AT&T Pebble Beach results. And uh, I don't know if you saw this, Cowboy, but... The ending was just, it took a dramatic charge on Sunday at Pebble Beach when, of course, uh, everyone's favorite lefty, Phil Mickelson, blows a two-shot lead and misses a short one on the 18th green. So we're going to actually get into a bit of discussion with that right now. So <clears throat> in between the Jim Harbaugh interviews and Ray Romano shanks, a couple of pros decided to make the Pebble Beach Pro-Am dramatic very, very dramatic at the final moment on Sunday night. But really, it wasn't Sunday night. That was more of a Sunday afternoon, if you ask us. So, Phil Mickelson started the day with a two-shot lead, trying to end an almost 950-day 950, 950 winless streak. But the lefty gave it away early and couldn't get anything going on at the back end, and then blew a chance at a playoff on his, you know, final green attempt. And... Phil is playing really well and close to getting that win, but the blown chance delivered the win to a, a to a long shot and a name that in the sport pretty much has been forgotten. So then the first thing we can learn about this loss, though, the under. But before we get into that, the underdog random can still be fun. So before we get into this underdog random, what were your thoughts on Phil Mickelson's? absolute choke on the 18th and just the final round itself i was like when i saw that i was just <clears throat> excuse me allergies as well but when i saw that from phil i was just like why i'm like you were doing so well you you're having such good you're you're looking really good on the on the on, on the shots and everything you were your pars were great everything was looking great and then what happened what what happened? he just he just lost it yeah, like it's, it's basically he had one of them. Uh, he had one of those Happy Gilmore moments, you know, where you suck, asshole. You know? No, it wasn't like that. But everybody all around the world was just in shock and awe of what happened. Except yeah, you're, of I course, would. if you're of course named Daniel Bolanos and Dennis Richards, then of course he'd be very happy about that. And if you don't get what I'm talking about, yeah, well, I'll tell, I'll explain that later. Yeah. But. The first thing we can learn about here is the underdog random can still be fun, right? So, Vaughn Taylor, even for the diehards who follow golf each and every week, is primarily known for being an unknown Ryder Cup participant. Anytime Taylor's name comes up, it's usually in the context of that awful, horrible 2006 Ryder Cup roster that was uh, destroyed by the Europeans. Taylor and Brett Witterich are the poster boys who, for the forgotten members of the despairing U.S. era guys who never did much after the fleeting appearance in the game's most intense event and most prestigious team settings. So, it's been a pretty much a grind for Taylor since the, uh, <clears throat> the 2006 Ryder Cup appearance. He's been on and off the tour, struggled to hold on to even the minor league tours, and nearly died in a boating accident two years ago. It did not seem like he would have another significant moment of relevance and golf, but 
a week ago, he has been, he was so sick that he had to be hospitalized in Columbia on the uh, web.com tour. He got a spot in this field because of a couple respectable finishes at what is arguably the tour's least notable tournament. So, Taylor was beyond a long shot. He was a long shot to make the cut, and while the networks, the tour, the media, and most of the fans would prefer a higher profile winner, those underdog, out of nowhere stories are also fun too. Mickelson's drought ending would have been a fabulous story, but seeing Taylor and his family afterwards, it's clear that the perks and status benefits of this win obviously mean more to them. It has been 11 years since he had won, and after withdrawing a last week's stick in Columbia, Taylor now has his playing privileges and an invite to the Masters in his hometown, Augusta. And you got to admit, though, that is pretty cool, though, to actually read about oh, that. Oh, yes, oh, yes, especially when... Uh getting to play in Augusta, and right now we, a um, little off topic, we have the Northern Tr uh, Trust Open right now going on as well, and it's looking pretty well with um, with C. Rivera, uh, B. Watson, Bubba Watson, and all that. Well, that's, that's just a tournament, yeah, that's just one of the get the tournaments that just gets you ready for the Masters, that's pretty oh, much yeah, what it is. But like, when you see some of the commercials, have you seen some of the commercials they've been putting on for the Masters? Like how They've been doing that since the first day of the new year. Yeah, but have you been seeing that, like how they've been showing how they're like getting the the getting it, everything all getting everything all ready and uh, everything like that? I think that's like I think that's amazing when you when you do a like when you do a little commercial like that um, for uh, a course like uh, a course like the Masters. That is beautiful, and honestly, I I've been actually it is. Talked to, I've actually talked to um, my dad about this, and my dad actually said. Um, He's go. Him and his uh, my stepmother are going to Augusta this year to um, actually see the uh, to see the entire event. Why don't they just take you, take you with them? Uh, because I don't want to go. Because I would go, but I don't want to go with my stepmom because her and I are like um, it's like fire and ice. So um, I even even if you had problems, I still would go if I was you. Yeah. If somebody right. invited me to go to Augusta, I would I wouldn't even have any second thoughts. I would just well, be like, you know what? Take me. Let's go. Well, I definitely want to uh, see it. They're in New York, so <laughs> what am I gonna do? Hop on a uh, uh, go hijack an old Concorde and go. No, you just thing? like get on a get on like a plane or something. They play they uh, play they pay for your plane ticket and then they you can just dad, be in like you know halfway. My, my dad paid for my plane ticket. My dad would be like, oh, uh, you're out of luck. Well, either way, but I'm just saying, like, they could, you could probably have, like, a ride or something from, like, one of their friends over there. Like, and I'm just saying, you can have, like, hookups and connections, though. Don't be afraid to do that. So, anyways, anyways, moving on here, moving on. Number two, let's go back to Phil Mickelson really quick. So, and he's been really so still close and really, really close at the same time. So, the broadcast just had to flash the stat that Mickelson was perfect from inside six feet the entire week before this ultimate putt on the 18th. So, of course, the broadcast pretty much just, all I got to say is that they just messed up his streak. Thanks for jinxing it, Jim Nance. But, anyways. The other thing, too, I'm going to say this, I noticed with Bill Nicholson. Uh, I don't know if you noticed this. When you're, when I, I was, me and Uncle Eric were doing some stuff, getting the car washed and stuff. And we were at a car wash, um, and we were watching some of the match. And when I was watching it. Did you notice that Phil Nicholson seemed to not, uh, not be putting his full weight on his left foot? Well, he's been having those left foot problems ever since, you know, he kind of, you know, re you know, aggravated it like a few years ago. But that's we'll, we'll talk about that coming up later on. So, in a different time, Phil Mickelson with a two-shot lead at Pebble Beach against a much, much less decorated leaderboard would have been automatic. So... He started this Sunday up to on a Hiroshi Iwata, and then the entire round was going to be a referendum on all the changes and tinkering done coming into the season. But, as he put it a few weeks ago, had him close to ending the winless drought. But Phil, who had not won in 938 days at legendary 2013 British Open at a Muir Field, did not have it all day. He's still close, no doubt, and as we saw that this week when we momentarily threatened to break 60 on Friday, then got around Pebble on Saturday with a bogey-free 66. Sunday was not really the same smooth ride. 
Mickelson's swing was not quite there, and he squandered chance after chance, particularly on Pebble's easier opening stretch. He threw away shots, quickly lost his league, and then stalled out on the back nine as Taylor went on his run. But because this is Phil Mickelson we're talking about here, he decided to make it interesting right at the moment you thought this was all over. He went to the 17th, two down to two to play, needing a wild birdie to birdie finish or a miracle eagle at the par 5 18th. In Mickelson form, he made the birdie at the a much more difficult par 3 17th, then missed the five foot birdie per, um, putt on the 18th to uh, force the playoff. Mickelson is in a good spot, and that winless streak is probably going to end soon. But this was a deflating Sunday for the 45-year-old who was perfectly set up to match a record with his fifth career win at this Pebble Beach event. So, your thoughts on number two, Cowboy, on this I whole like thing? I like uh, number two. I like number two, but the, the thing is, for me, I'm just going to say this. Um... Phil, I love you, man. I love you. You're a great player and everything. But the but the thing is, um, you need to have you need to do something with your with your stance on your left foot because I think that was part of his problem in the uh, in the outcome because he wasn't able to the way because what the way he swings and everything he uses his left foot a lot in his motions so. Him not be able to do what he um, uh, use his emotion, um, his motion right to um, help the outcome of his swing. I think was a problem for him, and I think also too with the Olympics coming up pretty uh, in a while, he's gonna have to have that fixed if he's gonna because we know we as we know he's gonna be one of those um, golfers to be um, competing in that. So. All right. So now, with that being said, we move on to number three. What's well, number three, you ask? Stay the F off Twitter, CBS. That is absolutely right. You heard me correctly. No, but in other words, stay off Twitter, CBS. So, aside from Mickelson, the weekend at Pebble was largely characterized by angry tweets towards CBS coverage. This event puts them in a tough spot. They promote this amateur aspect, and it's just one week of the year, so... Basically, you're going to go to interviews with, of course, Huey Lewis and Jake Owen and then see a bunch of wealthy, important businessmen hacking around this this beautiful scene. That was the entire Saturday broadcast. Jim Nance, we mentioned before, and Nick Faldo posted up the uh, 17th tee and interviewed all the executives and celebrities that rolled through. But both days, the golf from the actual pros seemed to be a minimal part of the broadcast interrupting the amateur interviews booth between booth interviews with Clint Eastwood and the AT&T CEO, amateur shots, lots and lots of commercials, and the footage of the local wildlife and scenery. Twitter is an angry place where people go to complain. Not shocking there. But the sentiment seemed unanimous, and it was an all-time frenzy, especially on Sunday. They savaged the CBS coverage, and the good thing about this event is that with amateurs and celebrities, this happens only once a year. The bad thing is is that that's probably why CBS isn't going to change how they approach it, regardless of how angry the people get. The tour is now off to Rivera, as Nick Cowboy Nick said, one of the best courses on the circuit, and both George Spieth and Rory McIlroy making their PGA Tour debut will be there. So, and that's pretty spicy, though, if you're actually a golf fan yourself. So, basically, it's going to be one of those events where it's actually going to be a very good, decent event during the time. So, your thoughts on at number three with the whole Twitter saga and CBS and all those people that work for the CBS, too. Two words. Thank you. <laughs> because, like, no, no, like, you see some of the stuff, like, you see when you're watching this event on CBS, like, you see, like, I was, like I said, I was watching it with my uncle, and we were actually watching some of these, we were sitting there watching some of these interviews. You're like, are you kidding me? What the hell? Are you, like, what are you doing? See, why this is, this is why I don't like CBS at times. Dude, CBS needs to grow up and get, and become, and, um, No, it's not that, well, I mean, you can say it's kind of them, and I understand why the people get angry at these sort of things, though, too. It's, no matter how angry the people get at doing the Twitter raid on CBS, 
CBS is not going to care, obviously. They're just going to keep doing the same thing over and over and over and That's over again. Over. And then it's going to be a never-ending cycle, and people are going to get even more mad, and then they're going to be like, oh, go F yourself, blah, blah, blah. It's so stupid. Remember what happened on Hole uh, during this event and what happened on Hole 3. We all know what happened. Everyone's seen that that event on Hole 3 during during the final round. When, when we all saw what happened with Phil Nicholson on hole three and you know who right behind him and what, ha- what wound up happening with C- with some of the CBS analysts. Yeah, I'm pretty sure, yeah, CBS, like I said, I never trusted CBS for oh, a no. long time. I mean, no, no. I mean, they're okay, but I've never really trusted them. No, That's the I don't, thing. I, I, for me, I, I, like I uh, again, they're okay. But would I ever, uh, would I ever go ahead and just, like, say CBS is, like, the best? Hell no. <laughs> of course, that'd be like, of course. But, but CBS, though, they have a lot on their plate this year to handle, but just with championship-wise. When you have the NCAA tournament, then you have the Masters, they did the Super yep. Bowl. Uh, and there's, like, a bunch of other things, though, too, that they... Well, what ha- well that incident with Hole 3, I think that was, uh, on the final round of that tournament was basically what started this whole thing to happen. Well, it's like I said, the whole thing, it's just, it's, it's a mess no matter what TV coverage you're at. With Fox, of course, it would be NBC, ESPN, you know. Okay, okay, I'll, okay, I'll throw okay, a curveball okay. and I'll say Animal Planet, but that we'll, 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 we'll talk about that, you know, later so on. Animal Planet do sports? Uh, actually, there's a stat that actually happened this year because... If you're living in Canada and the dog show that happened, we'll we'll talk about the dog show here in a bit. But Canada actually had the Animal Planet air, or the uh, the dog show was airing on Animal Planet up in Canada. So I mean, it does make sense if you. Well, either way, we'll talk about that a little bit later on because because right now CBS is CBS is a pile of trash, and I'm not saying you know Fox isn't or NBC is. I mean, they've had their problems too. Yeah. It's just. Oh my god, I just, I can't take it anymore. But the it's other embarrassing. thing is, also, for all you folks out there too, don't forget to take a look at the Northern Trust Open that's going on right now. Alright, so that's for all the diehard fans who want to get involved, but we'll, and of course, Cowboy Nick is going to be Bubba stuck. Watson's do, is going like, he's, right now, he's... Oh, bo- your boy Bubba Watson, another lefty. Yeah, he's doing, he's doing, like, he's like, right now, him and uh, Rivera... Is, Which I uh, do follow him on Twitter, by the way. Bubba yeah, Watson. Yeah, Rivera and uh, Bubba Watson right now are basically tied for first play, are like, they're like, right now, they're tied. Well, right now, it's only round one, and with round one, anything goes. Yeah, exactly, but that's still pretty damn good for, like, round one, and you're tied for first place. That's not... That could, that's you, know what, you know what, you can compare that with Phil Mickelson's lead on the AT&T. That could disappear yeah. at any second. I mean, yeah. you know, in a different time, though, you know, Phil Mickelson could have dominated. Oh. But, yeah, but he's 45 years old. I mean, he's still good, but he's, if you he's look, point where he's, he's, he's going to the it. point where he might have to go on the uh, senior tour. Pretty much. And just like with Tiger Woods, also. Wait, wait. Tiger Woods is going to be on the uh, on the on the senior citizens tour. Why are you so racist? I'm not racist. I'm just saying. That I mean, you talk about we talk about you know Phil Mickelson, Ernie Els, be like, okay, you know that's fine. But when we talk about Tiger Woods, you have to get all racist and be like, oh, you should retire and give up for Tiger good. Woods because I think he's too uh, his ego is just too big. Well, it's not his ego. Of course, he's he's backed it up, obviously. Yeah, but still, I over the years he's backed it up. You can't, you can't deny that. Let's, yeah, let's, let's go back. Let's go back. Okay, real quick. Let's go back to uh, eleven years ago. So Tiger's uh, infamous shot on the Masters, yes, on the sixteenth hole. That. that might have been one of the most historic moments in Masters history. You at least, at least admit that. I'm admitting that, and with that, with this, with that particular shirt he was wearing too. Oh, the red shirt, the infamous red shirt red that he shirt. always wears on the uh, final yeah. rounds of every single golf tournament. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, you gotta admit that he always wears that. I used to always say it was his. Uh, I used to always tell people, I'm like, you see, this is how you know he's a, this is how you know he's a gangster because that's his blood shirt. That's kind of racist, but okay. But anyways, we're gonna take another break here. Then when we come back from this break. We are going to be talking about the Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show, and we're going to give our recap and reviews for it. So, 
That being said, we'll be right back here on the podcast, episode number 63. Stay tuned, people. You don't want to miss anything. No! And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the podcast episode number 63. I am Kyle the Pug, a.k.a. Kyle Lodi, and this is, of course, is an individual who uh, wants to steal Shooter McGavin's jacket. It's Cowboy Nick. How you doing, folks? And uh, I'm just going to say this. Uh, I did enjoy watching the uh, the, West, the Westminster Kennel, um, Kennel Club dog show, but the, the judge, the, the old lady judge in the hound group, I wanted to knock her ass out for some of the things she was doing to those dogs. Well, speaking of which, that's what we're going to talk about, of course, right now. So, so for those who don't know what the Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show is, it's an annual event that's been going on for like 140 years, hence the uh, 140th Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show. Then it happens, you know, two day event, Monday and Tuesday night. Night. So, and it's not, and basically, if you guys haven't guessed already, it's a dog show where all these, like, millions of dogs from, you know, all around the world get together and they put on an event on uh, what they do for the uh, best, uh, for the, what the best looking dog is. And they, of course, they got seven groups. They got the hound, hound group, the herding group, non sporting, sporting, terrier group, toy group, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, that being said, they had a couple of finalists in that game, and I, well, you, technically you can call it a game and a sport at the same time. So, basically, I mean, some people will argue that the dog show it really, it really isn't a sport, but technically it really is though because it doesn't involve it does involve animals. And no, and no, cowboy, we're not talking about dog fighting. So keep your Michael Vick thoughts to yourself. So. That being said, we're going to talk about the winner, of course, of the dog show before we actually get to the other dogs in the event, was a German short-haired pointer named CJ, and it was a three-year-old dog, and it actually looks, you know, that dog actually looks not too bad, actually, for the German yeah, short-haired pointers. Beautiful, for me, that was, like, when I saw that dog win, I was like, yes, I was like, that's a beautiful-looking dog. CJ's a great-looking short uh, German short-haired pointer, um, and... It's just a beautiful animal. Uh, for all you folks that don't know, that dog is a, um, is what's known as a bird dog, and it's primarily used for duck hunting and things like that. All right, so basically, for those who don't know what's, who CJ is, so CJ has appeared to have, of course, grasp uh, Richard Means, the judge, of course, the advice to relax. So when he won, he was impassive, looking at the crowd as he might he have anticipated the outcome. Or maybe his serious demeanor was at another way to show his shock. His handler, Valerie Nunes Atkinson, was more emotional kissing mean and his rival handlers than dropping to her knees to hug and kiss CJ. Kind of weird if you ask me. But see, but this is what she said about it, and I quote, I just couldn't believe it. For us to be, for us in the sport, this is the pinnacle. This is what we strive for, for what we shed tears over. The uh, best dogs come here. And this is the show to win, unquote. So your thoughts on those quotes from the handler? I agree with that. But the thing is, too, when you look at the judge in that group, um, at that, when you look at him, I've seen him before, and he has two and he has two emotional emotions he shows. When he doesn't have a pick, he has a kind of a, a business face or the angry, um, the angry face. When he makes his pick, you'll see that he'll start to be more happier and um um smiling and he'll be more relaxed and then he'll make his and then he'll go and make that pick and with him he's also a veterinarian and from what i've heard to get into it to even get into his veterinary office you have to have you have to make a a appointment for your animal seven months in advance all right so going back to this article here really quick noons atkinson says she was thrilled to have won the sporting group earlier in the night and was apparently aware that the odds in Las Vegas were against CJ, whom she, whom she calls her quote-unquote heart dog. She was not intimidated, but the other dogs were favored over hers. And 
This is what she also said about it, and I quote, you couldn't go wrong with any of them, but I believe in my dog 100%. He's a great German short-haired pointer, unquote. So, after that quote, earlier in the evening after winning CJ's group, she said, and I quote, He loves it here. He was born this way. At six weeks, he walked across the living room floor, and we said, Oh my, he has the sparkle that makes you stop and look at him. And she also added, We expected great things from him from the start, unquote. So, so basically... This is what C- who CJ defeated here in the um, in the dog competition for the best in show, and we'll talk about these other dogs here in a bit as we recap them. So, CJ defeated Rumor, a German Shepherd, who uh, basically entered the uh, show as a top purebred dog last year. So, and then Lucy, a Burzoi, who was the best in all breeds in Japan last year, who won best reserve, by the way. Annabelle, a bulldog who was one of the crowd's favorites. Bogey, a smiling simoid or simoid, or whatever you guys want to call it. It doesn't really matter what you call it. It's just, it's, it is. People, people can say it either or. So, Panda, a shih tzu. And Charlie is a sky terrier who lost best in the show to last year to Miss P, a beagle. So, your thoughts on that competition, cowboy? It was beautiful, by the way. It's simu-made. Well, you can say it either or. Well, that's how it's pronounced. It's a Fr- it's the dog's from is a French breed, so that's how it's pronounced. Um, but with the beat with that with the dog that won in the hound group, the 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 Bozard and everything, that dog Lucy was a was a was a is a good dog, and it's a it's yeah, a I got best in show reserve. Yes, and and everything like that. But um, with her group, I'm gonna say this. The judge that did the hound group, that the old lady judge that did the hound group, that lady is was the wrong person to do a judging to do judging. Yes, we all know Cowboy Nick's little rants on certain little things that nobody gives a you know. Okay, okay, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna say, I'm gonna say this to you guys. I'm gonna say this to everyone who hasn't seen this. She was she was from the moment as one of the dogs would come up, she was grabbing its she was grabbing its man junk or or. <laughs> During when the, when the well, dog, isn't that what you're supposed to do? I don't think anybody gonna, will care, and especially right? nobody's gonna care in a dog competition. Come on now. No, no, no. Unless it looks really, really suspicious, you but touch the junk to like to see if everything's okay. But you don't grab it like as in with one hand, like uh, the to make it look like and make it look like you're trying to um, uh, ejaculate the dog. Okay. Okay. This is okay. This is you're, you're, this is getting disgusting. I want to move on, please. Can I? Can we move on? Thank you, Bill. We, you're saying move on here, but anyways, anyways. Okay. So from what I saw from all the seven dogs there in the best in show, I mean, as much as uh, it, it broke my heart to say this, but I actually wanted the German Shepherd to win best in show since I used to own a German Shepherd myself, and that German Shepherd I have talked about many times in the past. I can't really replace that dog because she was basically one of the most athletic dogs I've ever owned in my life and outlived the uh, lifespan of uh, 10 to 12 years, which she wants to live on, you know, 14, 15 years of age. So if you train them right, they'll outlive the uh, lifespan. So don't believe everything you read. Yes, and also... Um, I'm and I know who you wanted to win, too, was the Bulldog. I wanted Annabelle, yes. I was hoping Annabelle would win. Cause I can't help it. That I love that when they walk. I love that little waddle they do. I think it's I think it's like a... Uh, I think the, it's crowd, like a the crowd favorite, of course, according yes. to the article. But I also was hoping CJ would at least get a... Um, would get would get an award. But why? For the fact that CJ's coat was... Um, the coat, the muscular built of the dog, and the... Um, and the... If you look at it, the facial features and the um, mm-hmm. and the dog's um, ability of discipline you see in you saw, um, you see in the animal was very 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 good. And when I saw that, I said to myself, I think CJ's going to be the one to beat because when I looked at that, CJ is the kind of dog to when you look at CJ is the kind of dog when you look at that animal. It was it was just obvious that it was going to be the one that everyone was going to have to be. I thought Annabelle was going to do pretty good too, but I still say that I still say this good job for CJ and good job for Lucy. And honestly, Lucy for me, I thought should have been, 
should have um should have been told that it was um um was should have been told in the first when in its own group that it should have been awarded that it was an outstanding dog. It it was not said by the announcers, but honestly, that dog did have an outstanding um run around. Well, well all dogs had an outstanding run around. It wasn't just those those two, but all of them did as well. well. When you gotta look at it from the judge's point, Kyle. You look at the the muscular build and all that on the animals. That's what. Well, it is kind of hard to tell though when you're watching it on a TV because if you're a judge, you have to really look at it up close though. But for all of us in the audience, it's really hard yes. to tell. Yes, but that's why when I when, but you were able to see that with CJ and Lucy, and that's what turned. That's why they were able to turn out to do what they did. Yeah, so going back to, of course, I mean, it was, I mean, as much as, you know, I'm a dog lover myself, I'm like, you know, a huge fan of dogs, like beautiful dogs, so, okay, you can shut up, Nick, but that being said, I just, I just can't get enough of watching that annual dog event, I mean, it's not going to be around for, like, the next 362 days now, that's, of course, that's another year from now, but going back to CJ here really quick, so, basically, the notes on this, um, thing is that, of course, everybody remembers uh, Uno, right? Yeah. Remember Uno? So he was widely considered the most popular and best known best in show winner, was supposed to appear Monday night on the Westminster show on CNBC, but he was barred by the guest shot by Westminster officials after he had determined that he didn't, had not been registered to be at the show or inside Madison Square Garden as he was a former star denied credentials at the stadium. When security was told that Uno, 10 years old, was in a room used by USA Network, a part of NBC Universal, as it is CNBC, an an investigation began, of course, and having no prior approval to attend or any documentation, he was requested to leave the premises. And, of course, Uno, living on a ranch in Austin, was driven to Manhattan by the ranch manager, and, of course, uh, this was pretty much a misunderstanding to some people. So, your thoughts on this little mishap over with Uno? Well, a lot of times when you're having those kind of incidents, you have those incidents where people are mistaking, they're, they're, not, they're forgetting to fill out the information forms as well as you're supposed to. Um, when you do dog shows and stuff like that, you, you must make sure your animals are registered, pre-registered, and... um. They need, and everyone wants to know whether or not they're breeding at, whether or not they're, they're meant for breeding or not, because there was a couple of dogs in there that just recently, uh, that just recently <laughs> gave birth. There's birds in the background. Yeah. I'm walking over to my uncle's house real quick because I'm getting ready to do some ironing and getting ready to, um, get ready to, um, <laughs> cook dinner real quick. But, um, but anyway, like I was saying, when it comes to dog shows and stuff, you really have to look at where your animals are. You have to watch everything because the judges and everyone wants to know whether or not these dogs are owned by breeders, handlers, and things like that. You have to, and to do these kind of things, you have to know these things. And what happened in that situation was because he lives on a ranch and everything like that, it wasn't, was the information, that particular information wasn't given out, so without that information, you can't be in the show. Well, oh, speaking of uh, not being in the show, uh, what was your favorite dog throughout the whole competition? Just, like, apart from, you know, the finalists and all that. My The dog I was rooting for the most in the show came Apart from-, from the finalists, like, before the finalists were occurred. Oh, that's easy. Mine was the, uh, came from the hound group, and mine was the, um, my favorite was, in fact, the, um, it didn't win, but it was still my favorite, was the Norwegian Elk Hound. Okay, thank God you said that, because that's probably, like, one of my favorite hounds in that hound group, too, the Norwegian Elk Hound. It's beautiful. It's just, it, you can't help it. It's just so beautiful. Yeah, I mean, as much, you know, Basset Hounds, you know, I love Basset Hounds. I love any kind of hounds in I love general. The coon, I love the Coon Hounds as well. Yeah, but the Norwegian elk, elk hound is probably like one of my the favorite out of the uh, hound group by far. But oh, yeah. I can know your favorite. I'll for a little comical reasons. I know your favorite toy dog group out of that uh, whole little thing. I know what your favorite toy dog is out of the toy group. What would that be? 
Oh, either either the toy poodle or the Pekingese. Your call. <laughs> yeah, no, you no, you love you love the Pekingese. Favorite dog in the toy group. You love the Pe- is the, the Pe- Manchester Ter- is the Manchester Terrier, dummy. No, you love the Pekingese. The way that thing walks, so it looks like a mop. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna use the mop your floor. No, you can't hate on the Pekingese. Come on now. Hey, it's a good dog. Hey, it's, it's a good. And it's like a long-haired pug, is what it looks like. Just yeah, imagine with Pug with long hair, and then boom, there you go, Pug. How about your? How about um? How oh, about I you knew you were. I knew you were gonna say that. How about the fact that your dog was right there too? Yeah, well, obviously it's gonna be there. Actually, well, here's the thing. I asked, everybody's been asking me like over and over, is the Pug really my favorite dog? Actually, it's not. I mean, I know it's. I've had like a couple Pugs in my lifetime, and yeah, I like Pugs. You know, they're adorable, and they're, you know, they're so cute, they're ugly, you know, all this stuff, blah, 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 but, you know what, know what my, uh, favorite dog is? I'll name you, like, my top three favorite dogs. That, well, no, not this, God, no, but the, uh, si- the Siberian Husky is w- at least the first one. I, this isn't in any order, either, but the Siberian Husky, the German Shepherd, and then there's the other one that nobody knows about, is the Norwegian Lundehund. Yes, and that's what it actually is. It's yeah, you you can look it up and you, those dogs are actually badass. Especially the puppies are adorable too because they have the webbed feet and they climb and they can climb up trees. Yep. And those yeah, those are basically my top three dogs. I would d- basically yeah, would my, like to my own. top three are the go goes as goes as this. My top three are excuse me goes first is the not in any order though. The Norwegian Elk Hound. Yeah, I love the Norwegian uh, Elk Hound. Yeah. The my this the next one, it has to go to the American um the Amer it goes to the American Coon it goes to the American Coon Hound. Um you saw you saw that on there, the American Coon Hound. Uh huh. And then my third goes to and it, that's it my third one's in the herding group and it is it is the, it is the, um, the, it goes to, and it's the, uh, Icelandic Shepherd Sheepdog. Ooh. What about, you know, what about the Newfoundland? You forgot about the Newfoundland. Newfoundlands the Newfie. Are, are a beautiful dog, but I, um, those are the, those particular three are the ones I like the most. Yeah, I know, but I'm saying like, I'm, yeah, going to the Newfoundland real quick. Um, yeah, they're like giant like, black bear, brown bear dogs or whatever. You can, you know, like, call them whatever you want. But yeah. they're they're not, they don't even, t- they're, like, one of the sweetest do- dogs in the world, like the St. Bernard is. Like, they don't even yes. hurt you. They just want to just want to cuddle with you and just start licking your face. And I remember, I told you about the time of my giant dog, right? Let me ask you this. What do you well, wait, 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 hold on. I'm, let me ask you mine first. You, remember I told you about my giant dog that I had, like, a while back, right? Maya? Yeah, yeah she was, like, a a black and white Newfoundland, but she she looked like she was a giant black bear, but she was like the biggest sweetheart in the world. They are. Yeah, and then, yeah, she was, you know, she was very cuddable. She didn't do anything. She protected the little dogs from, like, uh, outside intruders. Yeah, all that. Yeah, they, and, they, and they are. They're very beautiful dogs. Like, for me, my, 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 uh, for me, my dog that I had back when I was a little, when I was younger, was my was my Labrador Retriever. Oh, we had a ton of those. Yeah, was my black my dad, Labrador my Retriever dad, My dad, my dad loves Labrador. So what was the question you were going to say earlier? Uh, I was going to ask you, I was just going to ask you this, Kyle. What, what do you have against the, um, what do you have against the poodle? No, <laughs> just the look of it, I just can't stand. It's like, it's like, imagine, like, a French girl or something going, you know, having a big ego. That's what the poodle stands for. I'm not trying to be like, you know, stereotypical or anything, but that's just kind of what it reminds me of. All right, for, ladies, if you're living in French, I'm not saying all of them do, but I'm just saying that just imagine. In English, please. In English, please. But anyways, anyways, we're gonna, we're, yeah, I agree, Bill, we're gonna cut him off. So, 
That being said, we're going to take our final break. And when we come back from this final break, Hockey Town with Cowboy Nick. Stay tuned for that. We'll be right back. And welcome back to the final segment of the podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Episode number 63 on Kyle the Pug Sports. I am Kyle the Pug, a.k.a. Kyle Lodi. And now we are going to tune it to uh, everybody's favorite part of the show for all hockey fans everywhere. In a segment we like to call, Hey Hey, It's Hockey Town with Cowboy Nick. It's me, Cowboy Nick, Cowboy Nick, and we're all here um, enjoying uh, some great moments here, right here on, right here on the great show. And right now, we're going to start off with a great episode by um, a great, a great little moment. For all you folks that didn't know, NBC ready to feature <clears throat> Bob Chase. For all you folks that don't know who Bob Chase is, this guy, a lot, I know, I, I know a lot of people have heard of him in the history of, um, a history of the of NBC and everything like that, but this is what's um, happening right now. Bob Chase, what they, what a, what's the great, the greatest thank you and um, protege has ever been able to deliver from the um, the mentor Mike um, Doc Ermick, um have have um, have scored the game winning goal. And NBC Sports was looking uh, for the future ideas to highlight Sunday's Hockey Day in America promotion. Um, in, um, unqual- uh, unequaled Hall of Fame announcer Eric um, Emmerich suggested a look at Fort Wayne's um, um, at Fort Wayne um, at Fort Wayne's Bob Chase might be um, might be. Um, uh, interesting. Chase is a, um, continuing his 63rd season announcing Fort Wayne Comics um, games. Um, Fort Wayne Comics is a um, ECHL team. It's, um, an, an, um, it's an ECHL team. Comics games, and throughout, he, um, and though he just turned 90, he has still got the same passion. Most of the um, energy, and all of the knowledge that makes his calls of game special. And this guy just turned 90 and just survived having uh, prostate cancer. Mm. And he's 90, and Kyle, he's 90 years, he just turned, and he just turned 90. Shout out to all the 90-year-olds out there. Yeah, and he's 90 years old, and he's still out there acting like he was, like, our age. Um... So NBC is going to air a short feature of Chase um, uh, on Chase called "The Doctor's um, Inter- uh, Interruption," something during the Buffalo and Pittsburgh game, which will be begins at 12:30 p.m. It will likely be broadcasted during the first intermission, which would be great for Fort Wayne fans because. The Comets have a home game starting at 5 p.m., and they plan to show the clip over the um, the clip over the scoreboard. He is the um, one of the greatest people in my life," said uh, Emmerich, a Le Fontaine native um, who who got hooked on the sport while watching a 1960s Comets game. I'm proud to call him my friend. I hope the piece um, um, reflects how all 
of us feel about him. And it ends with the, and it ends with this, folks. So it, this what it ends with. The sport will feature footage NBC taped January 2nd during a Comets trip to Toledo and January 17th when um, Emmerich showed up at the Montreal uh, Coliseum to celebrate Chase's birthday. Um, to that celebrated Chase's birthday. So, so that is like that is one of the greatest stories ever. This guy has been broadcasting games. <laughs> he started when he was he started his first. He got the job when he was our age, when he was me and Kyle's age, and now he is ninety years old and he's still broadcasting. Well, just like a bit like the Vince Scully of the hockey world, I take it. <clears throat> Yeah, exactly. That's what I, when I saw that, I'm like, I was thinking the same thing. And people are saying that, um, they're saying that he even had, he even still, he, he's 90 years old. He's still driving and everything. He had, he's not like the typical old, per, like old 90 year old person who would have someone helping him. He's doing everything himself. Well, that's good. Yep. And the next story we're going to get into is, um, here in the AHL, for all you folks that don't know, we're going to go ahead and talk about the ice caps. Um, Falco named CCM all, um, AHL Player of the Week. Um, Springfield, Mass. The American League announced today that St. John's Ice Caps goaltender Zach Ful, um, Fulcal has been selected as the CCM um, AHL Player of the Week for the proud ending of February 14th, um, 2016. Falcon, who won each of his three starts. Last week, while stopping 100, um, stopping 107 of 111 shots, good for a 1.32 goal, a goal assist average, and a 0. 0.46, um, a 0.964 save percentage. So this guy, this guy's pretty good. Uh, St. John's was outshot by a combined total of one, um, 111 to 60. In Falcons three um, outstandings, but put together this first three game winning streak of the season thanks to the rookie goaltender's um, efforts. Falco begins the week um, by earning the first shootout by uh, in, um, entering the first shootout of the professional career of his of his professional career. Um, a thirty nine save percent. Um, Percentage in the the Caps four to an O win over Syracuse on Tuesday. He um, back the next game uh, the next night and made thirty six stops at St. John's. Um, defeated the Crush the Crunch in overtime four to three. And on Saturday night, Falco shot down the league leading Toledo Marlies, making thirty two saves in a. Three to one victory over the league leading Toledo Marlies. A second round choice, 36 overall by the Montreal Canadiens in 2013, uh, in a, uh, NHL draft. Falco has improved to a 13, 11 and three with a 3.05 GEA and a 0.906 save percentage in a, in 30, um, percentage of for St. John's this season. The 20-year-old rookie uh, uh, from Rosemary, Quebec, won a um, Memorial Cup championship with Halifax, the Q, um, QMA J, um, JHL in 2013, and a gold medal with Canada at the 2015 World Junior Championships. In um, Re, uh, recognition of his act, uh, achievements, Falco will be uh, presented with an um, Crystal Award prior to an upcoming Ice Cap home game. So, so this guy has been performing really well, beating out um, the Toronto Marlies, which is the top team this year, leading their um, leading the um, their their area. So it's it's pretty it's going pretty well. It's going to be a good it's going to be good for a team's um, to see this guy, this guy's gonna be probably in the um, on the ice, St. John's Ice Caps for I would say another three months, um, and probably looking to be called up by Montreal um, pretty soon. So, 
So, so it's looking like that. And now we're going to get into some, um, we're going to get into in the NHL. For all you folks that haven't heard about this, it seems to be taking an awful long time for the NHL commissioner, Gary Bettman, to come to what seems to be the most logical conclusion to Dennis Widman's 20 game suspension for, um, for crushing an unsuspecting, um, linesman, Don Henderson, from behind was the fact a just a fair um, pushment for a, a usually act of vi- um, punishment for a u- an, 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 uh, for an unusual act of violence against an official. It will it will be um, become a footnote in the in this course tale that it. Um, it took a full week for, um, from the time of the Calgary Flames defensive men's appeal hearing to the time of the ruling um, was announced by the commissioner. We, um, what won't be forgotten is Bittman stood behind the original ruling re- um, reinforcing that this act, whatever the um, consequences, however fo- uh, foggy, was the word they used. Yeah, they used the word fogey, F-O-G-G-Y, fogey. Um, Whitman might have been from a, um, been from a hit taken moments before is unde- um, undefensible. That's not this, um, not to say this was an easy decision for the, um, outfit citizen commissioner. It would have been easier for Bittman to re, um, reduce the ban to 15 games or even lower. Such a move might have acted as a prior um, improvement strike to keep Whitman from appealing to an independent third-party abattoir. A something, uh, avatar, a something of the rough edges of the 20 game ban, one of the longest in NHL history. But in upholding the suspension, the line is drawn in the sand, vis a vis, that league stands on <coughs> abuse of officials. And that should be a uh, banner just as the intern, um, the intel punishment was imported in reinforcing that players, teams, officials, and on ice officials, sh- um, so too was Bettman's ruling upholding the ban. Beyond that, the Hockey League, uh, um, this is where it ends at, the Hockey League um, has also thrown down the gauntlet to Weidman and the National Hockey League Players Association. And that is your ECHL NHL News. I am Cowboy Nick. And back to Kyle and what he thinks on this standing. Kyle. I have none. That is all. <laughs> so you don't have anything to say about the ruling that they that they came out with and everything? Actually, no. I've been looking some stuff up this whole time. So you don't agree that... Uh, I, I never said I didn't agree. I'm just saying, like, I've been looking some stuff up, though. But the story with um, with the what's-his-face at 90 years old, I forgot the name now because I was looking some stuff up. I mean, that's a really cool story, though. But overall, it has Bob that Chase. Vince Scully-like Bob feel. Bob Chase. Yeah, it's a Vince Scully-like feel. Yeah. And what do you think about... I'm just saying, what do you think about the fact that they're doing this 20-game ban on a guy uh, for a player being um, hitting an official from behind like that? Was it accidental or was it on purpose? There, because there's a difference. Say, the ruling is that he did it um, He did it out of anger. So. Well, that's. I guess that's the proper punishment then. Or it could be... It may be a bit more, but it seems about right. Yeah, because you don't, you don't just knock someone out just because you because you're angry for uh, for a call they made or something like that. KO. <laughs> That's so. like boxing like feel to it. Yeah, exactly. Like if you if you want to do something like that, go um, go do um bare knu- do like the old school bare knuckle boxing. <laughs> there you go, Nick. That's something you can do. Bare uh, knuckle boxing. Well, well, I mean, why? I mean, it'd be something you would do. 
bare knuckle boxing meet? Like, who am I gonna like me getting in a bare knuckle boxing match? You'd want like Uncle Larry and you'd wind up carrying me out to the car. Yeah, but what if it was me you're going up against? Yeah, but I then you still get you murdered. In the face twice and no. then punch you in the stomach and gouge your eyes out. No, then you would probably you would probably the same result would probably still happen to you. See, you're you're kind of a hypocrite there. But I would still but I would still punch you in the face. Like I, like I said, I would punch you in the, even though I would probably get knocked out. I would still punch you in the face and gouge your eyes out. No, you wouldn't be able to go near him. I would try. Yeah, yeah, you would try. You will try, as Anakin Skywalker line from Star Wars Episode Three, going the nerdish route. You will try, but you will not succeed. Exactly. I would. I would like literally just be like trying to like. You would. Just, just your... let's just, let's be let's put it this way. You wouldn't do something evil to your own homie. No. Exactly. Just, See. Point. Point given. point given. Point given. <laughs> He's all stopping. Yeah, like, you know, like, like I'd be on that like that new that new show that everyone like is watching on um American History Channel, the uh, the Blood Feud. Yeah, totally, dude, totally. But either way, um so what what was this thing you wanted me to wanted to tell me about, like during the break? Like you were you were talking to me about my uh my funny moments video. Oh yeah, I was just saying, like with the with like, what was up with those like that um, with you with those girls? Okay, first off, the chick had a fiance. Let's just put it at that. Put it right there, and I guess there was another point in the video where I guess the same chick was from California. She's like, oh, you should hook up with her, blah blah, holla holla holla. Or what? I don't remember exactly how it went, but yeah, I mean, like, I mean, I was like, okay, what is this e harmony dot com or something? Oh <laughs> right. I have no idea. I mean, it's just random PSN moments. It's just, it's, I don't know, it's kind of stupid. She was talking about how, her friend, like how she was going to have her friend, um, like, try to hook you up with her friend or something like that. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> it's just, the whole thing is just kind of stupid. It was, I thought it was funny as hell, because I'm like, I was like thinking to myself, I was like, go, Kyle, go. Go, you, go, you player, go, pimp. <laughs> yeah. That's just, that's something you should do. I already have a girlfriend. No, you don't. You 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 need to go out and get a real one. Your your left hand doesn't count. Fuck you. Hey -o. Get, my rip. girlfriend would kick my girlfriend would kick your ass. No. Highly yes, doubt it. Would. Highly doubt it. <laughs> you don't what, know what she like what's she gonna do? Try to stick her beaver like Donkey Kong sixty four face as she gotta run at me going and then all of a sudden I have to be like Donkey Kong and just do that DK roll. From Donkey Kong 64. One, 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 and then out comes the watermelon, and then I get health back. You. you talk to my, you, you say things like, that, you say a word like that about my girlfriend again, I swear I will, I will rip your dick off and feed it to the homeless. I was joking, dude. You need to chill, man. Don't mess with her. <laughs> oh, rip. <laughs> Nick gets angry over the slightest things. Well, don't mess with her. I never want. I don't even want to. I'm just saying. I'm just saying that as a joke. Come on now. You know. You know. You thought it was funny. Come on now. It was funny, but like I said, just don't. Just don't let her hear you. She will. She will hurt you. Like I care. Come on now. What's 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 gonna happen? She's gonna like fucking. Excuse my language, but is she gonna like? Is her fist gonna come out of my phone? But you like. <laughs> Maybe, is that what's maybe, gonna or she'll be like, uh, or maybe she'll, like, you'll be like one of those moments where, like, like, you're like, you know, like on the exorcist where she's just like, 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 she starts like walking down, like walking up your stairs doing the spider walk. Uh, okay, so, yeah, even Bill said he's heard enough of this. He needs, he just wants you to know that you need to calm down. I'm just saying, um, I know. So. Yeah, he even, he, even, yeah, he said it was a joke, so just chill out. Are, so, we ready to are, we, are we ready to close and everything? Or what? That is absolutely right. We are ready to close out the show. And we just wanted to say that thank you so much for tuning in on the 63rd episode of the podcast. And if you want to enjoy more of these videos, go to youtube.com slash PugNameKyle for my sports channel. And also subscribe to my main channel at youtube.com slash the Kyle and Lodi Show. So, with that being said, we are out of here. Thank you guys so much for watching for this little sports show we did today. 
And we have to thank also Bill and Jim keeping an eye on things, even though Jim didn't really say much. Because, oh, now you're saying, okay, yeah, now you speak up. And, of course, we have the illustrious Cowboy Nick. Yeehaw, yeehaw, yeehaw! And I didn't, keep in mind, I did not say illustrious, I said unillustrious. Actually, no, I said illustrious, because he's really ill and sick in the head. I almost wanted to say unillustrious, but I don't know if that was actually a word. But, anyways, I'm Kyle the Pug, a.k.a. Kyle Lodi, and we'll see you guys next time in our next video. Or actually, just me, though. I don't know about Nick, but maybe me or, or have us both. I don't know. But either way, we'll see you guys next time. Same time, same place. Have a good day. And as always, stay safe.